Hi everybody, this is Julian from Hugging Face. In the last few months, we've all experimented with great models like Llama 2, Mistral, and many others. And we've seen how amazing they were uh, for chatbot applications. However, when the time comes to deploy those models to production, it's not very easy to get the low latency and high throughput that we expect. And in previous videos, we've discussed different techniques on optimizing those models, like better attention layers, quantization, compilation, hardware acceleration, etc. In this video, uh, we're going to dive into the actual inference process for those decoder-only models. And we're going to look at how techniques like the KV cache and continuous batching and speculative decoding can help increase performance. All right, sounds good. Let's get started. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing to my YouTube channel, and don't forget to enable notifications so that you won't miss anything in the future. Also, why not share the video on your social networks or with your colleagues, because if you enjoy this, it's quite likely someone else will. Thank you very much for your support. Before we want to optimize inference, we need to understand how it works. So let's start with how decoder-only inference works. So decoder-only is the architecture of those uh, GPT-like models like uh, Llama, Vicuna, Mistral, etc. Right? And because they're decoder-only, of course, they're a little bit different from the traditional model architecture for transformers. Right? So if we look at the uh, the reference architecture from attention is all we need. Uh, we won't need to have an encoder because uh, here the input will be basically just a prompt, right? We're not doing sequence to sequence, for, uh, which we would do for translation or Q&A, right? So we don't need to train a model on this is the input sequence, let's encode it, blah, 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 and let's match it with the ground truth output sequence, blah, 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 and then predict that, okay? So um, there is no such thing. We don't need encoder, decoder, multi at attention because we don't have an encoder in the first place, right? So our inputs are really the prompt, or I should say the tokenized prompt, and then we embed it, uh, encode it, and then uh, run it through uh, the decoder and generate tokens, okay? So that's um, the, the basic architecture for uh, GPT-like decoder-only models, okay? A bit simpler, you could say. So inputs um, are processed uh, in the following way. When we say inputs, again, we mean the tokenized prompt. So they're embedded, they're encoded positionally, and then we run uh, multi-head attention to compute the keys and values for, uh, for each of the input tokens. And the, those KV values will be used to uh, to actually generate um, the next token, right? So this is a um, pretty much with something you can do in one go. Um, this is highly parallel. It's a large matrix multiplication, and well, that's what uh, AI accelerators have built built for. <laughs> so uh, we can do this very efficiently, uh, and um, we see pretty high usage on the hardware accelerator, right? So not saying there's nothing to optimize, but generally this is working well out of the box. And um, and that's not the number one problem we want to solve. The real problem is, of course, once we've done that and we want to generate the outputs, well, we do that one token at a time, right? So based on the uh, uh, the input prompt, uh, based on the KV values we computed, then we generate the next token, and that's one at a time, right? We take that generated token, we append it to the previous input. So let's say that's the first token we generated. So now we have the input prompt and an extra token. And we do this again, right? So process the input, compute KV, generate token number two. Take token number two, append it. Now we have input prompt plus token one plus token two. Do it one more time. 
embed, encode, KV, generate, etc., etc. And now you see the problem, right? Uh, this is a highly sequential process, uh, and we repeat it until we've generated the maximum number of uh, allowed tokens or until we generate an end of sentence token, right? So if we're going to generate 500 tokens, we're going to do this 500 times, right? Um, embed, encode, KV, generate, append, repeat, right? And the problem is um, this is sequential. And so uh, sequential means we can't parallelize much. And so we see low usage of the hardware accelerator. And this is why we see low throughput uh, overall. And, and unless we start optimizing, we're not going to get great performance and great cost performance out of that, um, out of that LLM. Okay. So let's see what we can do. The first obvious thing we can do is, can we avoid recomputing KV values again and again and again for the same input tokens, right? Because remember, we do it for the prompt, okay? KV, right? Lots of dot products. Um, generate a token, add a token, Okay, so we are now we have sequence length plus one, <laughs> right? And we do KV again, but all the original values will be the same because those are dot products. So we would only really need to generate K and V for the token we appended, the one we generated, right? Because everything else will be unchanged and it's just a massive waste of time. So I said it's highly parallel and fair enough it is but it's still a waste of time. So can we speed up that particular part? Yes, and that's the purpose of the KV cache. So the KV cache will store the keys and values for all the tokens we've already processed. Okay, and you can see an example here, which, uh, uh, which is nicely illustrated from a, uh, a drawing uh, I, I took from the AWS Neural Doc. Thank you for that. So first token is high, second token is love, third token is tranium. Um, so let's say we're focusing on, the, on tranium right now. We only need to compute um, the keys and values for, for this particular token, right? The rest we already have. You know, we've already seen I, we've already seen love, okay? We've already generated and computed them. So we don't need to compute all those things again. Right. If you want to see the actual uh, matrix uh, operation, this is what it looks like. Right. When we add a new token, we extend the sequence length. So we have a new key and we have a new V. Right. And this is really the only thing we need to compute. Uh, all the all the other stuff. Right. Uh, the gray stuff here. I don't know if you can see my my mouse, but K prev and V prev here uh, are the gray areas are uh, are cached. Right. And that's the purpose of the KV cache. Okay, save us from computing um, those, uh, those operations again and again and again, right? And obviously, the longer the sequence, the, the more impact this is going to have, right? Obviously, it doesn't work for the first token because, um, because everything will be empty. And that's why the first token takes longer to generate, right? And that's why in the benchmarks, you see the time to first token, which is a measure of you know how efficiently you you do you manage k and v in general uh, and and then you see the average time for the next tokens because this is more a, a measure of the generation process itself right so we're going to cache that stuff we need to understand how big that is uh, this will be in accelerator ram and there's never enough of that so we need to be careful so if we work with fp16 models this is the formula so we can see the cache size is uh, grows linearly with respect to sequence length, which is kind of obvious. Uh, the number of uh, attention layers, which is kind of obvious. Um, the embedding length, which I think is kind of obvious. And also batch size, right? And we need to multiply by two because uh, we have K and V, <laughs> right? And we need to multiply by two again because we have 16 bits. So two bytes for each, um, 
uh, for each uh, value, right? So for a 7 billion parameter model, this can be uh, north of 2 gigabytes already. And of course, the bigger the model, the more layers, the larger the embeddings, uh, the more memory you're going to need, right? Um, this could come at the expense of growing batch size, right? Because uh, if k the KV cache is huge, then you don't have a ton of space left to uh, increase the batch size and parallelize things further. Um, and, and that's why the more recent attention layers, uh, which I covered in this uh, better attention layers video, uh, work at uh, shrinking the KV cache in different ways. And, uh, and, and you can see, you know, you can learn about multi-query attention, group query attention, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which are used in, uh, in uh, neural models like, you know, Llama 2, uh, Mistral, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and see why that makes a big difference in shrinking cache size so that we can increase the batch size again, right? It's a never ending battle. Okay, let's move on and, uh, and see how we can improve the, uh, again, the parallelism of inference with continuous batching. So we're all familiar with batching, you know, processing mini batches uh, on, uh, on accelerators to increase throughput and to leverage the, you know, the thousands of cores we have in there. And we could do the same with those decoder only models, but the problem is they're harder to batch than uh, I would say traditional transformers like translation or Q&A and generally harder to batch than deep learning models. And there's a good reason for that. The reason is the input and output length of your uh, conversations can change a lot, right? Um, maybe one question has a very short prompt. Maybe another one has a very long prompt. Maybe you want a yes or no answer, so very short output. Or maybe you want, you know, a full page, so very long answer. And so in terms of processing time and generation times, you will see very, very different things, which you probably wouldn't see if you were translating, um, you know, English to French, max, you know, 300 tokens, right? Or 512 tokens. So that's the, that's the problem, vari the variability. So let's look at an example. So here are the lines are different requests, okay? So we have four requests and we see the time steps, uh, T1, T2, T3, etc. okay? So the yellow squares are the input tokens, the blue squares are the generated tokens, and the red squares are the end of sentence tokens. So initially, fine, you know, we load four um, inference requests on the, on the accelerator. It starts generating, you know, a T3, T4, T5, all good. A little while later, um, well, we see uh, the third um, request was pretty short, ended at T5, first one ended at T6, um, and the second one was much longer, and it ended at T8, right? And because it drags on, you know, we have to wait until it completes to run another batch. And, you know, immediately you see what the problem is. There's really only one inference request being processed on the, on the last few uh, time steps. And everything else is just completed already. And it's a, it's a waste of hardware resources, right? And so that's why traditional batching, there's processing, let's say, 4x4, four 8x8, four, eight eight, whatever, uh, and waiting for all of them to complete is not a really good idea here. Instead, we want to do continuous batching. So it starts the same, but as soon as an inference request has completed, uh, we evict it and start another one, right? So for example, you see on the first line, um, the request ends at T6, and immediately at T7, we have something else running, right? And, uh, and we're certainly not waiting for the second request to complete a T8, right? Same for the third request, same for the fourth, okay? So as soon as the request is over, bam, we, we feed another one to, uh, to the GPU. And that's why it's called continuous batching. We never stop, okay? So we try to keep the hardware as busy as possible. So obviously here, we're only looking at the generation process, but what about prefill, right? Uh, remember... We need to um, we need to embed 
and encode and compute KV or retrieve KV from, from the cache. And so it's not just the generation bit. So can we pause the generation process to run that input processing, that pre-fill process for the new queries that we're going to run in the future? So yes, we need to do that. Otherwise, you know, we'll uh, I guess we'll we'll run out of uh, we'll run out of queries to to process and we'll stall the the, the whole the whole thing. Um, so depending on the the inference server you use, you know, you you may have a, a parameter to control the ratio of I would say waiting input queries versus uh, running um, uh, generation queries. Right, and in uh, in our uh, TGI library where this is implemented, uh, there's a parameter called waiting served ratio. So you can control how often you want to pause the generation process to uh, to pro to uh, run prefill for the next uh, the next ones. Right, bit of tweaking here. Okay, so continuous batching, uh, very very good technique, makes a makes a very very large difference. Now let's talk about the third technique I wanted to discuss today, um, which is uh, more and more popular, and it's called speculative decoding. Uh, and if you're completely new to this, uh, there's this really cool blog post by my colleagues. I highly encourage you to read it. So we said the, the generation process only outputs one token at a time. Okay, so it doesn't make... Uh, it doesn't make really, really good use of, of the highly parallel hardware we have on high um, that we have on AI accelerators, right? So the, the whole process is really not compute bound. Uh, in fact, a lot of hardware is just uh, doing nothing. It's really memory bound because of the KV um, um, cache we need to um, uh, load again and again and again on the accelerator, which is all the more reason to shrink the cache and make it work better, right? So bottom line is we have compute resources available. So the basic idea would be, can we use that idle compute to do something smart? For example, could we use a smaller model, all right, which would be a decent approximation of the large model to predict several completions, you know, multi-token completions in parallel. Um, and, and, you know, in a way that would be, uh, you know, that would tell us, hey, um, I know you're generating a token right now, but I think the next four, five, six tokens could look something like this. And here are, here are five, six, seven different ways to do it, right? So looking ahead in a way. Uh, with a smaller model that is more nimble um, and uh, and that can leverage the the idle compute that we have right that's the that's the intuition so of course at some point we need to look at those uh, potential completions and see um, you know which one is the best which one has the uh, the largest number of correct tokens uh, and and pick and pick that one right so and that's exactly what we do we ask the large model to evaluate those, you know, three, four, five potential completions and pick the, the ones, pick the one, picks only one, picks the one that works best, right? Uh, and that means pick the one that is closest to what the large model would have generated, you know, sequentially, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So at each iteration, we'll still get one valid token, right? The one generated by the large model in the usual way. And if the small model did its job well, then we could have way more, right? One of those completions with, let's say, five, six, seven tokens could be, could be great. And then maybe we have six additional tokens in one go. And so we save, um, we save six runs through the large model and that's where the speed up comes from so that's a very clever idea so let's look at an example so let's look at an example so let's say we start from the quick brown we ask the small model to uh, come up with a completion 
So let's say one of them is Fox jumps into the, okay? And then we take the full, uh, the full sequence, send that to the large model and ask it, is this what you would have generated? And it says, well, Fox jumps is fine. Into the is not what I would have generated. The next token would have been over, okay? So I'll discard everything after jumps and append over. And we do that again, right? Want to see it once more? <laughs> Let's do this. Okay. Right? So feed that to the small model. Generate a completion. Again, uh, we're only showing one completion here, but keep in mind, we would probably generate many uh, different out possible outcomes. And then we ask the large language model to uh, validate those tokens or invalidate some of them and add the one it generated after that, right? So that's, uh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool and that works very well. So on the, in the bottom left here corner, you see uh, the relationship between how well the small model approximates the large model. That's a parameter called alpha. So if alpha is close to one, then the small model is a really, really good approximation of the large model. If it's lower, then it makes a lot of mistakes. And on the y-axis, you see the number of expected tokens we can uh, validate, right? So obviously, if alpha is uh, 0.9 or higher, um, the number of expected tokens will be very close to the number of tokens that the small model generates, right? And you can see the different colors for different numbers. That's a parameter called gamma. Uh, if you move left, right, then uh, the model is not, the small model is not a great approximation and the expected number of tokens is quite lower than what the small model generates because obviously some of them will be discarded at validation step, okay? Uh, we can see what that means in terms of speed up. So for example, if we have um, alpha at 0 0.8 and uh, gamma at uh, five, right? So a decent approximation and generated five additional tokens for each completion, uh, then uh, we see that the speed up can be up to, you know, three plus, right? X, 369X. Um, so two to three is already very, very good. Now, if we have alpha up to 0.9, we can get even better, especially if we increase the number of sequences. But then again, it means you have a really, really great small model and that might not be the case so in the paper they actually test this with a t5x excel which i think is 11 billion and they try two tasks uh ende which is a, a translation task for from english to german and uh, cnndm i believe is a summarization task and they approximate the large model with a smaller versions of the same architecture t5 small t5 base etc and you can see uh, for, for translation, for example, um, with seven predicted tokens, T5 small gives you a 3.4x speed up. That's the first line on that, uh, on that table. Okay, so that's, that's pretty amazing because T5 small is, uh, is a much smaller model. And in the paper, they actually recommend going uh, um, to models, to small models that are at least one order of magnitude smaller, right? So uh, at least 10x smaller, maybe even two orders of magnitude. So maybe a hundred X if you have that. Okay. So it's amazing to see those small models doing really well and delivering real life speed ups of, you know, two, 2.5 uh, and sometimes over three. Right. So that's, uh, that's uh, speculative decoding. Now, obviously the big question is how do we build that small model uh, here with the T5 example, it's pretty simple because we have many different, sizes of T5, but that might not always be the case. So let's look at different options. So the first one is the one we just saw. Uh, it's, it's available in different sizes. Fine. Try the, the smaller ones, figure it out. 
Another way to do this is uh, to use an n-gram approach, and model is really not the right word because there is no model per se, as we will see. Uh, this is really a clever trick um, where we use pro uh, tokens found in the prompt, right? I uh, will we'll look at that. And then we can go a little fancier. Uh, we can uh, fine tune a small model based on the large model, which stays frozen or we can fine tune the small model and the large model together, right? For maximum performance. Okay, let's quickly look at those four. So the first one, the small off the shelf model is really the T5 scenario. Uh, I won't discuss this again, but here's how you would do it with the transformers library. Um, we can see uh, the Pythia uh, model here. So 1.4 billion and 160 million. So about a 10 X ratio here. We load both, right? And when we generate with a large model, we just pass the small model as a parameter, okay? And that whole process of generating uh, potential completions and validating them happens under the hood. So if you're in a scenario where you actually have models in different sizes, this is a really cool thing to try because you could get out of the box, you know, 2x, 3x speed up without even training anything, just, uh, just letting the, the little guy do the, some of the work, right? The restriction here is that the two models need to have the same tokenizer. So again, you would probably look at two models from the same family just coming in different sizes, okay? But very simple, uh, very elegant solution. Okay, option two, n-grams, okay? So let's look at this. So this is a community contribution. I highlighted the repo and uh, a nice tweet from one of my colleagues who kind of, uh, who kind of puts everything in perspective. So that's, that's super nice. This comes from the observation that for some tasks like uh, summarization, Q&A, uh, short discussions, code editing, and so on, um, there's a very strong relationship between the tokens in the input and the tokens in the output. Another way to put it is, words that are found in the prompt are very likely to be found in the generated answer okay and it's actually more than words it's n-grams so fancy statistical word i guess so uh, an n-gram is just you know either a pair or a triplet or whatever you know it's a it's a short sequence of related words and so again observation shows that those tasks, and they're called input grounded tasks, because again, the output strongly related to the input will have that property. So can we use the strings? Can we use the words? Can we use the word pairs in the input to complete, to accelerate the completion of the output? Well, absolutely, right? And that's exactly what this, uh, n-gram speculative decoding does and it sounds like a very simple almost a trivial thing but it works very well for those tasks right where again uh, there is a strong relationship speed ups 2x to 4x uh, no model modification it should work with any model and it has no impact on output quality so uh, and this is implemented in transformers um, so where it would probably not work is if you ask a very short question and then ask for, you know, 5,000 tokens. Because again, you have so few uh, uh, input tokens that you can't really um, pick from that to generate a long answer. But for shorter tasks like this, uh, it works well. So here's an example. Uh, we have a prompt about a French football player. We extract um, n-grams for that. Uh, ask the large language model to validate, just like before. It will validate some of them. It will add, maybe discard uh, some of them, and it will add the token it generated. And then we do that again, right? So exact same scenario as before, except here there is no model predicting. It's really just uh, using n-grams to... Uh, uh, finding n-grams in the input and concatenating them. So that's a very fast process. And this is how it works in the transformers library. 
you just need to add that simple parameter prompt lookup num tokens and that's it right so uh, again um, great great uh, solution um, definitely worth a try and uh, and and the benchmark and see if you can accelerate your uh, uh, transformers and your generation process with this right and this is available in our uh, tgi library it's just one command line parameter all right uh, let's talk about the last speculative decoding technique i wanted to cover today which is called medusa so in our four options we saw uh we could fine tune a, a model uh on either on top or together with a large language model so this is what Medusa is about, except um, there isn't a standalone small model. What we're doing is we're adding decoding heads to the, to the LLM to predict multiple outputs in the parallel, right? So we start from, you know, let's say your Llama, your Vicuna, whatever, and we just insert additional decoding heads so that instead of generating one, output it can generate multiple outputs in parallel and we verify them uh, at each decoding step right and select the one that works best so this is what it looks like so on the left you see the original model right uh, the decoder only architecture we kind of you know plug in uh, medusa heads which will uh, each generate a new potential completion and then at decoding stage, we actually pick uh, the completion that works best, keeping the tokens that are validated, discarding the ones that are not, and adding the one that the original model generated. Okay? Um, to, the whole process uh, is based on a, on a technique called tree-based attention, which is uh, nicely explained in the paper. I won't go into the details because I don't want to do another one-hour video and uh, and bore you to death um, but um, there's a there's a, a specific algo to do this uh, verification and selection at the decoding stage so the next question is how do we train those medusa heads in two different ways uh, medusa one where we leave the original model alone and we only fine-tune the the medusa heads themselves right so that's the option that I mentioned before. Leave the LLM alone. Fine tune the a model, so to speak. In this case, just the heads. Um, this is a, a, a rather efficient uh, process. Uh, the paper refers to uh, Vicuna 7B um, and 60K samples um, and how that only took five hours on a single A100 GPU. So a few GPU hours, depending on the, the size of your data set. The reason why this is efficient is because they use parameter efficient fine tuning uh, with a Q LoRa, so LoRa plus uh, eight bit quantization. Uh, if you're not familiar with Q LoRa, uh, I have uh, I have a couple of videos on uh, on LoRa and Q LoRa on my channel. The second technique is uh, joint fine tuning. So we fine tune the heads and the model together. And if you were going to fine tune your LLM anyway, I think that's the preferred option. Um, because, of course, the heads will be tightly related to the model and you can expect better performance. If you have your LLM and you're happy with it and don't want to fine-tune it, I just want to accelerate it, then Medusa 1 is a, is a good way to do this. Here's a cool animation uh, that I found in the repo. Uh, I think that's Vicuna here. Uh, so you can see this is clearly 2x faster. Uh, I can't read those tiny numbers, but yeah, 28. <laughs> no, I can't read it. Uh, you, you can pause the video and look at the numbers. But yeah, it's two, 2x two plus, right? So they also report some numbers on uh, 7b, 13b. And you can see um, Medusa 1 is uh, over 2x faster. And Medusa 2 is almost 3x faster. So quite a nice uh, improvement. And obviously, that's because if we fine-tune the heads and the model together, They'll just perform better. They'll just generate um, a better uh, potential completions. And so um, fewer 
tokens will be discarded. And of course, uh, that means saving uh, more iterations through the larger model and speaking, speeding things up more, right? Makes sense. So that's Medusa. All right, as you can see, um, decoder-only inference is a very interesting topic, and uh, there are many, many ways we can accelerate it, from the KV cache to uh, stop computing those KV values again and again, to continuous batching to make sure we keep pumping requests to the accelerator as soon as it's, it's got some uh, available compute, and of course, speculative decoding to just uh, save us from generating every single token through that large, slow uh, LLM uh, and use smaller, uh, hopefully accurate uh, approximations to, uh, to save time, right? So this is a very active field um, and uh, I'm sure we'll see more techniques. Um, feel free to try them. Feel free to try them in TGI, as I've said, uh, all of that stuff is implemented there. So that's, uh, that's a good uh, sandbox for you to, to try them out. And don't forget, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Helps me with the YouTube Rico. I appreciate your support. And until next time, keep rocking.